uh, webinar on revisiting significant beneficiary ownership, popularly known as SBO, under the Companies Act. Friends, recently the company uh, Affair Ministry advised companies regarding compliance with the provision of significant beneficiary ownership. This advisory was caused anxiety amongst corporate entities and professionals. It is not a new law. Uh, much before this, ROC issues notices to numerous companies for the adjudication of penalties under Section 90 of the Companies Act 2013, which were later withdrawn. Section 90 of the Companies Act provides for a declaration to be given to the company by every individual acting alone or together or through one or more person who holds the beneficial interest of not less than 10% in shares of the company or the right to exercise or the actual exercising of significant influence or control over the company. Although it has been uh, now more than four years since the notification of SB Oak regime started, companies continue to face difficulty in identifying the SBO in certain cases, specific situations, and various interpretative challenges surrounded Section 90 of the SBO rules. Now, friends, as you are aware, the concept of SBO, which is very clear, the idea behind this, the SBO is a uncover individual or entities that have a significant influence or control over the company, even if they don't directly hold shares in that company. This aids in uh, transparency, ensuring the companies cannot hide the true ownership or beneficiary behind complex ownership structure. If I can simplify, the basic purpose is you have a web of companies, multiple companies, multiple structure, but they want to know who is the person. Person means the, uh, or the, the, the beneficiary person who is a individual or company. And in the company, who is behind this, in, uh, this company, who is the individual? So you have a company, company is holding shares in another company, then that company is holding shares in another company. But ultimately, one person who is controlling the company, who is the ultimately beneficiary of all these company, is someone. So they want to know who is that someone that is that comes under significant beneficiary ownership. So they talked about direct and indirect ownership, criteria for SPO, that is also they brought out reporting and compliance and legal framework is important. Now, if we see the India, so some people say that when the SBO came, the people were saying, oh, what is this? It is very complicated. But when you go to outside India, you'll find each and every jurisdiction, they require that you should tell us who is the beneficiary owner. And I was just analyzing the other jurisdiction so in UK, in USA, in EU, there are there are governing laws in India like Companies Act, UK also Companies Act 2006, and US that is a Bank Secrecy Act, and EU that is a Fifth Anti Money Laundering Directive. So you can understand Bank Secrecy Act, Money Laundering Act, Companies Act. So other places they have a different types of uh, requirement and law. So in India, we call significant beneficiary owner. UK, we saw person significant control, PSC. In US, we say beneficiary ownership. And EU, EU also beneficiary ownership. Now, the interesting point is that in India, we have a 10% shareholding concept. More than 10% shareholding, voting right, control, all other things. That is a part. But in UK, USA and EU, that is a more than 25%. So this is in Indian law is more stringent than other part of the uh, world. They are talking about the more than 25%. So this is the major difference. Disclosure, you have to submit to the ROC that report. UK also, you have to submit to the their ROC office. Uh, that's called UK Companies House. And the uh, uh, US, when you are opening a bank account, you require to submit this. 
and uh, in EU, EU, they are reported to national registries that is there. Purpose is the more or less same. It is in India, the, when they came out with, they mentioned that transparency ownership and prevention of money laundry. That was a major concept. In UK, their purpose is they are saying increase corporate transparency, reduce tax evasion and prevent money laundering. So money laundering is common in all the places, but here they want to see that tax evasion should not be there. Uh, US, they also talk about the financial transparency and provide crime, uh, money laundering, and other uh, types of uh, crimes which are there. EU also talked about the money laundering and terrorist financing that they want to see through this uh, beneficial ownership concept. There are some exemption uh, in India also, like India's, uh, like holding company where detail of SBO are already available in the public domain, so you don't require. But in other part also, they are also given some uh, uh, exemptions. Penalties in India, fines and potential imprisonment for non-disclosure, but in UK, civil penalty, restriction of shares and potential crime, criminal san sanction is also there. So you un can understand that it is a serious offence. And the US also civil and criminal penalties, including fines. And EU also varies of members, state, they, uh, usually including fines. So that depends upon the country to country. Now, this is the difference I have told you. Issue is what are the benefit of SBO concept? So first is the transparency and accountability. Second is it prevents financial crime because you know the who is the beneficial owner. And you will not um, under because when I'll give you some example of Indian frauds which has taken place because of this. So you will realize that how this can stop the uh, financial fraud. It protect the investors, protecting the investors because the investors should know who is behind this company, who is behind this. They should know everything. And if you have a less uh, complex structure, you'll do straight. Then corporate governance issue is also um, applicable here. International cooperation standard also requires significantly beneficial ownership and building public trust. That is another aspect by doing this. Now the question is, this concept came recently after 2013 uh, Act and uh, um, uh, when the SBO concept came five, six years back. What was the, um, uh, how the India was managing? So there was a shareholder disclosure was there, but that is a vanilla disclosure that you have to disclose who is individual, who is co companies. Then KYC norms for opening of accounts, that is also there, that is also not very strong. Then director's disclosure was also there. Then provision under the FEMA, that is was also there. And regulation, the, the SAST, uh, that is also required some disclosure. And then in, in income tax also, uh, these are the disclosure, disclose, undisclosed foreign assets and other thing you have to disclose. So uh, this was the earlier law. Uh, where per, only thing is there was a vanilla disclosure. All companies, all individual, all things you are getting, there's no interconnect, there's no behind the, behind the scene uh, that, that you can go uh, inside that was not there. Now, what was the manipulation people were doing through this? Number one, they were layering of companies. They were making multiple layer of companies. That's called the web of companies. Then they were doing tunneling. Tunneling means dominant shareholders, at the uh, managing the minority shareholders, dominating uh, uh, dominant shareholder, controlling the minority shareholder, and then there was an OPEC system. So you can see the tunnel system where you can't see the light, what is next. So that is there. Round tripping was also taking place. Tax evasion was taking place. Money laundry was using for this purpose. Related party transactions through BEM, X company holding by, by company uh, holding. Um, Z, Z company holding an A, and then you are doing transaction with A, and that is also related party, but it is not reflecting related party. Then corporate governance issue was there. Okay, the uh, lack of uh, accountability was there, and then uh, avoiding regulator uh, regulatory caps like you have a FDI cap that you can't do more than this much in this industry, or you can do uh, uh, this much of percentage. You can hold. Uh, you can bring FDI. So through this route, people were avoiding 
the, uh, the regulatory caps. Then market manipulation was taking place because hidden control was there and people were managing uh, like you can hold not more than 75%, but they were holding 75% through the web of companies they were holding indirectly other shareholding. So liquidity was less in the market. And in the takeover also, people were managing this way. So these were the manipulation. And if you see this, some example of manipulation, Satyam computer. There was one classic case of 7,136 crore rupees fraud, which has taken place. And it was a lack of transparency. And there was a so many company, PNB, Nirav Modi case. That is also because of complex intercompany transactions were there. Where were companies across jurisdiction helped mask the fraud. Then Kingfisher also is spending various countries uh, made it difficult for Indian authorities to identify the, uh, the, where the asset lies there. If you remember in 2070 Paradise Papers and the Panama Papers 2016 case, uh, and it was also reflecting, uh, uh, revealing complex network of offshore companies, trust and fund uh, uh, foundation used for tax optimization, evasion, and sometimes money laundering that was there. 2G spectrum cases also that controversies also were multiple layers, including fund companies, intricate corporate structure. These all things were because of 2G scram has taken place. Coal block also was the same that you were holding uh, in indirect control. Then Sahara and Sevi case is also, there are so many companies and there were no transparency. If you remember Enron scandal in USA, that was also a classic case of this. Recently, we have seen in 2018, ILFS. And this is also a classic case of multiple companies and multiple uh, web of companies were there. Recently, 2019, DHFL case is also there. And it is also untraceable loan and fund which were diverted because of complex web of shell companies. Then in 2017, government has uh, cracked down shell companies and two lakh shell companies they have removed because of this, this reason, because that, that was a use for conduit. Then Vodafone tax case was also there. Here also in the judgment, it came in 2007 that the complexity of cross-border merger transaction and the importance of clear tax regulation of different jurisdiction, they have done the arbitrage of regulator and cross-border. Then recently, Z Group allegation is also there that they are controlling companies in this. So these are some example of live case, which we have seen. It was a directly, suppose SBO was there that particular time, then they could have identified and the web of companies uh, that could have avoided. And then recently in government of India also in 2013, they have mentioned that two layer of subsidy, not more than this. That is also a concept which has restricted now. So friends, today's webinar, we have organized to discuss the key issues related to SBO, provision and advisory issued by MCA, because MCA which has given advisory. And the main point which we want to discuss, origin, implication, and complexity of identified SBO. Uh, that is main issue, how to de determine SBO, compliance requirement for disclosure of SBO, and implication of non-compliance. So that is a main topic we want to discuss. And these are the issues which are coming because now government is very strict and money laundering law is very, very tough now and they want to identify. So I extend a very hearty welcome to our galaxy of speakers, those who are doing day and night of this work in practical experience. First, Mr. Amit Gupta, who is a practicing company secretary and insolvency professional and advising various corporate on SBO related things. I welcome Amit. Then we have Mr. Ankit Singhi, Head Corporate Affairs and Compliance, Corporate Profession. He is also advising various listed and listed companies on this aspects. And because he is receiving various companies, so you can understand that he can be a, uh, he can tell us what are the issues companies are facing. Then we have a Nitesh Letwal, uh, Associate Partner, Corporate Professional. Uh, and uh, he looks after the compliance and due diligence and corporate profession. And uh, all three speakers, uh, they are uh, doing day and night this type of transaction, this type of advising to the people, and uh, they will do. Uh, they will tell us uh, the issues, what companies are facing, and what is the solution. Uh, so the program structure is 
first Nitesh will give a presentation on this and then Ankit will um, uh, tell us about the intricacy of this subject and then Amit will tell and then we will, we will have a question answer. So I will request all uh, uh, participants, if you have any question, you please share with us. We will ask uh, from these three uh, panelists of our um, uh, today's session. Now I will request uh, Nitesh to share uh, the presentation on the concept significantly beneficial ownership, a step towards transparency and prevention of misuse. Over to you, Nitesh. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me opportunity to speak on this burning issue, actually. Burning issue because, uh, because uh, MC has recently issued advisory to all the Indian corporates. It is uh, louder. Yeah. So, uh, so the, the purpose of this webinar is not only to educate uh, the corporates, the uh, dear colleagues or professionals about the SBO rules, but also to decide the future course of action against the advisory issued by the MCA to the companies regarding the compliance. So, uh, so, so, so why this advisory is issued actually? So whether uh, we, 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 we treat it as that uh, all the Indian companies are uh, not doing or uh, are in default of the SBO rules, the answer is no, because uh, they have uh, issued the advisory, but not the show cause notice. So we need to understand the intent behind it and the reason behind it. As you are aware that um, uh, Mr. Pavan sir has uh, already highlighted that uh, many companies are following SBO rules. Why this SBO rules uh, is there in our uh, statute? It was not there uh, before this Companies Act or uh, Companies Act 2013. Even after the introduction of the new company law, the SBO rules are not uh, very much there in our statute. It is because uh, it is because. Uh, it is because of that uh, various conventions to which india is a part so there is a there is a there is a watchdog a, a, a watchdog which uh, which counter the money laundering and the terror financing which we call it as a faft so faft uh, as per the reports that uh, they are visiting the india to evaluate in fact the on site evaluation in the next month regarding the steps taken by the Indian government and especially the financial sector regulators, which are which includes RBI, of course, SEBI, IRDA. So they will take care, they will check whether the steps have been taken in a right direction to counter uh, terror financing and money laundering and uh, and uh, proceeds of the crime so 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 on on that premises the MC, uh, in the in the in the initial year of 2023 we have uh, we have seen that uh, uh, the pmla rules have been amended initially the percentage of uh, any any uh, determining the any beneficial owner was set at 25% which was in a staggered manner reduced to 10% in all th uh, in all the uh, 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 in all the statute whether it be a rbi companies act or uh, PMLA rules. Now the the limit is uh, now fixed as a ten percent. Uh, initially, it was uh, it was it was uh, it was mismatch in terms of uh, the percentage wise. And uh, under PMLA rules, it was set earlier as a twenty five percent. However, in the, in Companies Act, it was uh, from from the beginning it was uh, fixed at a ten percent. So 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 let's uh, let's 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 go back to the MC advisory. So what could be the our course of action? First, we need to understand. So uh, as 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 I already uh, already explained that it is not a show cause notice. So what we can do is what uh, what course of action a company uh, has to have uh, in the, uh, to deal with this advisory. If you do not have uh, any kind of SBO in your company as per the the Companies Act rules, then you need not to uh, you need not to uh, worry about it, and you need not to reply over that email. You just uh, comply with the rule, and if there is no uh, no SBO, then uh, you can you can remain silent on that. If you have already done your filing, you can also ignore that, and no need to reply. If there is a and if there is if there is a SBO in your company and you you have a reason to believe as per the rules and uh, and you have taken the step 
and uh, and if there is any kind of declaration you receive from the SBO, then it's better to file uh, SBO declaration as soon as possible after taking a obtaining a declaration from the significant beneficial owner. If if there is a SBO as per uh, as per your understanding or as per the the documents or as per as per as per the documents available with you and you and it is not disclosing, then you take that uh, steps to to inform such SBO to file their declaration. And uh, if and that uh, if that SBO is not declaring uh, himself as a SBO, then you need to take uh, steps which uh, in the coming uh, upcoming slides we will deal in detail. So let's uh, let's understand what is SBO. So SBO, if uh, as uh, Pavan sir has already highlighted that SBO are the natural persons. Uh, you uh, the, the 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 concept behind the SBO is to is to is to unearth is to identify who are the actual owners of that company or any entity, or not if not owner uh, who are the who are behind who are controlling that company who are controlling even the shareholder, who are puppet at their uh, end who are actually taking the decisions on their behalf or who are actually enjoying the rights or uh, kind of uh, rights or privileges uh, which are connected with those shares. So, uh, so if we go by the definition, so beneficial owner means you are acting alone or together with some other person. If you are in a, if you are in a concert with the other person, then both the person is SBO or the beneficial owner. And if you are, uh, if you are uh, actually a beneficial owner, if you are uh, controlling the sh uh, controlling some stake in the company, not directly but through other person, then you all uh, you you will still be considered as SBO. But there is a condition attached to it that every every shareholder is not a SBO. You need to have uh, fulfilled the minimum criteria or minimum stake. Uh, which is 10% uh, or more of uh, shares in a company or voting rights or you have a right to have distributable dividend or other kind of distribution which are attached to the shares or you have a right to exercise or actually exercises significant influence or control. If you are complying with these provisions, then you are a SBO. If uh, if you are a beneficial owner of less than ten percent, then you need not you uh, you will not be considered as a SBO unless until you are uh, you 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 uh, unless until there are some other person to whom through you are actually exercising or you have a stake more than ten percent. So uh, so 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 uh, so ten percent uh, so ten percent criteria is uh, there in the statute so uh, one has to see that uh, that minimum ten percent criteria has to be uh, complied with or has to be uh, have in that company so so how how can you see that ten percent you need to see direct holding if if you have it and plus indirect holding so it, it is very important to understand that direct holding is need not be necessary indirect holding is uh, very much compulsory in order to trigger this uh, sbo uh, criteria so if you do not have any direct holding but have an indirect holding of more than 10 percent then you are a sbo Vice versa, if you have a direct holding of at least of uh, more than ten percent, and if you do not have any indirect holding, then you are no, need not you you cannot be deemed to be considered as uh, a SBO because it is everybody know that Mr. X is holding fifty percent, so they are uh, he is the owner of that company or a majority holder of the company. So it is very much there, or it is very much uh, evident from the records, and. Uh, and in case of uh, in case of significant influence or control, so you need not to see that uh, whether you have any kind of stake, whether it's a direct stake or an indirect stake. If you are uh, if you are through some kind of understanding, some kind of arrangement, if you have you are controlling or having significant influence in a in an Indian company, then you will still be considered as a significant beneficial owner. So. So then, uh, the next step is uh, with 
with respect to acting together because acting together is very uh, is very much a kind of uh, subjective issue so how can we say that uh, this person is acting together or not acting together so we need to check the facts if you have a intention if two parties are uh, are are in a are in a kind of arrangement or a understanding whether formal or informal then you are uh, you are deemed to be a, a person acting together and then uh, both then the shareholding of both those persons or both the persons or more than or more than two persons will be clubbed together to 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 check the criteria whether uh, whether you are whether whether the aggregate shareholding is exceeding 10% or no uh, or or not so so with the common intent and the per, and the and the purpose of exercising control or significant influence over a indian company so so it is it is very much sufficient to 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 come to a conclusion that uh, they are acting together uh, it need not be necessary that both the parties are uh, relatives or close relative even a friend with a better understanding more than a relative can still be considered as a person acting together and uh, need to comply with the provisions of the sbo rules the next uh, is, uh, is with respect to understanding the concept of the beneficial interest so beneficial interest uh, is actually a uh, important criteria in order to uh, trigger this uh, sbo rules so beneficial interest uh, is defined under section 89 so which says that person alone or together with any other person whether directly or indirectly through any contract or arrangement holds rights or entitlement to exercise or cause to be exercised any or all of the rights attached to such shares or right to have or participate in any dividend on distributable uh, or other distribution as connected with with those shares so uh, so uh, one needs to to be a uh, to be called as a sbo you need to have beneficial interest in in those shares those beneficial interest under the sbo rules has to has to have through indirect route so uh, to be declared as a beneficial owner you need to have beneficial interest uh, just like right to uh, rights attached to the shares right to receive dividend but it must be through indirect route then only you can be called as a sbo because under section 89 uh, uh, the beneficial interest uh, is defined uh, considering both section 90 and 89 so that is why they are using directly or indirectly but for the purpose to declare it as a sbo you need to have beneficial interest indirectly so the next is the shares so uh, for 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 having a 10% stake in the shares so what do you mean by share share means uh, obviously share means uh, which have voting rights which have dividend rights so you need to have shares equity shares uh, for most equity share is a criteria but if you have other shares which are convertible into equity shares like uh, compulsory convertible debentures convertible con uh, compulsory convertible preference shares and uh, global depository receipt then those will also be considered as shares and for the purpose of voting right because voting right is also a main ingredient to trigger the sbo rules so preference so those preference shares will also be considered who uh, where the uh, where the preference share holders have the voting rights and generally preference shares do not have voting rights but in case uh, you, uh, the company fails to fails to pay dividend for uh, consecutively two years then they they get the voting rights uh, automatically so in the, if the preference shares are there on which the company did not uh, have not paid a dividend for the last two years then they will also be considered as the as as, as shares normal shares for the for the purpose of this uh, sbo rules how in case of uh, differential voting rights and uh, where voting where voting rights uh, are uh, 
maybe 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 lesser or you enjoy the more voting rights then those voting rights will also be considered for the purpose of sbo rules in, however in case of optionally convertible instrument and those uh, kind of instrument uh, has to be ignored because uh, because it uh, because the rule specifically says it has to be a compulsory convertible so uh, so the compulsory convertible instrument will be uh, will be will be considered for the purpose of sbo rule so uh, meaning thereby that the total uh, the, the total number of share has to be seen on a fully diluted basis whether it be a equity share or a compulsory convertible uh, instrument including gbrs so, uh, nitesh uh, yeah uh, and amiti uh, in case of uh, compulsory convertible instrument for example where we generally find this problem that in case the ratios are fixed uh, conversion ratios but at times we have seen conversion ratios are not fixed and will be determined for example at a later stage uh, depending upon the valuation at that point of time in that case how to determine the diluted share holding Ankit, your uh, if I understand correctly, your point is that uh, as Nitesh was mentioning, mm. that uh, in case of convertible securities, we have to take uh, the fully converted value for the mm. purpose of determining the thresholds of ten mm. percent or whatever holding mm. they are. Mm. So if uh, uh like we have issued the ccps where we have taken the option that we will do the valuation at the point of time uh, when the conversion will take place mm. in such situation you don't have a option but to assume that uh, conversion will take place at the par value and basis that only you will determine in absence of any uh, available conversion formula we have to consider uh, on the basis of uh, par value conversion. But can't we take a stand that since the convertible conversion ratio is not available, hmm. therefore it is not possible to calculate the diluted uh, capital and therefore we will not consider that holding. Because I don't think uh, that taking it on par value will suffice, it might lead to a wrong uh, disclosure because ultimate, because uh, the, because that uh, the disclosure is based upon a probability as opposed to where a conversion ratio is fixed you know the number of shares that will trigger definitely there in that case also there is a probability depending upon the capital that would be there at, at the time of conversion but still you have something i agree in both situations yeah. uh, it is uh, leading to a non-compliance hmm. point is that if let us assume that majority is going to be held by a person who is a CCPS holder and I mm. have not uh, yet disclosed as to what is the formula mm. and maybe if uh, uh, I presume the conversion ratio uh, of prescribed number then uh, someone else is actually controlling the company and his name should be declared mm. whereas we are preventing the name disclosure by not doing so. So although no clarity is there so far but uh, what we are given to understand that uh, because conversion cannot take place uh, at a price less than the fair value, uh, mm. the par value. So we presume that uh, the conversion will take place at that price and uh, we are uh, taking that stand as far as our uh, understanding is concerned. It is any uh, different view that we have been taking? No. Okay. So, uh, so as we uh, uh, in the in the previous slide, as we uh, I already uh, uh, highlighted that uh, uh, that uh, indirect holding is must. So it's a basic criteria you need to check on. Uh, so we it have. It's a little bit louder. Yeah. Yeah. So we have uh, prepared one uh, permutation combination where we have uh, where we have uh, 
made some kind of uh, cases that uh, in case there is a direct holding only, indirect holding is not there. So SBO rule will be applicable or not. The SBO rule will not be applicable if you do not have any indirect holding. Uh, in case uh, you have uh, nil direct holding, uh, nil direct holding but uh, having indirect holding then the SBO rule will be applicable yes the SBO rule will be applicable subject to the meeting the uh, minimum uh, threshold criteria and in case you have both direct and indirect holding then uh, uh, you, it, it will be applicable because you have something as an indirect holding so all those uh, direct and indirect holding will be clubbed to check the minimum uh, to check to check whether we are meeting the minimum threshold criteria of 10% or not. So, so there's a, one more concept of uh, holding the rights directly or indirectly. So direct, so direct holding is uh, something. Uh, uh, so, 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 so a, a shareholder who is an individual. So, so the main principle of the SBO is to find out who are the natural person, not the corporate person or corporate member we need to check the who are the natural person who are behind the such kind of structure or kind of uh, web of structure in a companies so we need to check whether who are the real owners or the real uh, beneficial owners who are actually enjoying the fruits of uh, shareholding through a different corporate structure. So here are some few example uh, uh, where uh, 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 individual, a natural person holds indirect stake in a company. Uh, it can be a body corporate, including a company or a foreign company. It can be a HUF through Karta, you can uh, hold a stake in a company. It can be a trust where uh, where the beneficiaries enjoys the right there are many companies who there are many companies through uh, under which the promoters holds a good stake and there is a partnership firm which you find very less but still there there can be a route to hold shares there is llp structure where you can find some kind of share holding of a natural person through llp and there is another concept of pooled investment vehicles where uh, you can hold investment like uh, rates and invades. So if you are holding any kind of uh, uh, ho holding, holding, uh, 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 if you uh, if you have any kind of shareholding through this structure, then it will be covered as an indirect uh, holding. So uh, we have, uh, for the purpose of better understanding the concept of uh, indirect holding, uh, more specifically, to understand uh, the uh, to understand through a live example, uh, where uh, one one has to determine whether there is a SBO or not. So uh, in first example, uh, Miss uh, the X Limited, which is a reporting company here. So it needs to determine who is a beneficial owner. And there is another company who holds 10% uh, uh, or more 10% uh, in that X limited. So we need to check where, who holds the Y limited. And in this example, Mr. A holds more than 50% in Y limited. And, 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 and for this purpose, Mr. A becomes a SBO of uh, X limited. So X Limited has to uh, report to the registrar of companies that Mr. A is the SBO of uh, our company. As far as Y Limited is concerned, for example, Y Limited is a, under the Companies Act. Every company under Indian uh, Indian Companies Act, incorporated under Indian Companies Act, is a reporting company. Uh, this is the general rule that every company is a reporting company, but need to check whether the whether the SBO rule is applicable or not. So it need, so every company needs to determine whether they have it or not have it, whether they have SBO or not SBO. In case of Y limited, why uh, if, 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 we, if we determine from the point of view Y limited, Mr. A is directly holding 50%. As I've already told you, if Mr. A is only is holding direct holding, of 50% and there is no indirect holding in Y Limited, then Y Limited need not uh, to file anything because it is very much evident that Mr. A is uh, holding uh, Y Limited or uh, uh, controlling that Y Limited. In, uh, in, in another example, uh, there is a, a reporting company X Limited 
and uh, under which uh, mr uh, uh, y limited holds uh, more than 10% and y, and y and uh, z limited is a holding company of uh, y limited under which mr a mr b and mr uh, and uh, and miss c holds uh, different different stake so for the purpose of uh, sbo in case of x limited mr a becomes a uh, sbo reason being that uh, mr a holds majority stake in that uh, uh, in the z limited so th there is a uh, another uh, example of uh, indirect holding so in where indirect holding is a uh, indirect holding stake in the company through a trust model so there are a uh, different kind of uh, trust which are uh, generally uh, incorporated or registered it's a dis if it is a discretionary trust or a charitable trust or any specific trust if it is a discretionary trust or a charitable trust which is generally uh, made for a public at large where there is no such identifiable kind of uh, beneficial owners so in that case uh, who will be the uh, whosoever is a trustee of that uh, trust will become a sbo for the purpose of uh, sbo rules so in the first case uh, mr a which is a trustee of uh, a trust holds more than 10% uh, stake in a x limited and x limited being a reporting company needs to determine where, who is the sbo of my company so being a trust which is in the nature of discretionary or a charitable trust mr a will become a will become a sbo for this uh, for this uh, very structure so there is another example uh, in case of specific trust so specific trust uh, are nothing but who which are uh, generally made for a close uh, close relatives or uh, or friend circle where there are identified beneficiaries so those beneficiaries uh, will become a sbo for the purpose uh, for the purpose under these rules uh, in a, in this example x limited being a reporting company in which uh, trust a holds more than 10% of stake and uh, trustee mr and trustee is mr a and uh, there are two beneficiaries identified beneficiaries so so uh, being a uh, beneficiaries they become a uh, sbo uh, for this purpose uh, amit sir anything you want to add uh, or you want to uh, highlight upon it no i think uh, we can proceed with once we are okay. uh, with the basics uh, then we can take little complex situations uh, I think. okay so it is a uh, there is one more example so uh, wherein uh, a wherein uh, x being a reporting company wherein uh, uh, a trust holds twenty uh, percent, and in the trust, the trustee is a body corporate. So, what needs to be checked? So, uh, a trust being a discretionary in nature, and a trustee being a beneficiary, uh, uh, trustee is a body corporate. Then, in in this case, uh, who will who will be declared as a who will be declared as a, uh, a SBO for this purpose? Ankisa. Have you have any kind of uh, point on this to add? According to you, who will be that uh, uh, SBO? So Nitesh, uh, I huh. believe uh, in this case where yeah. X Limited is a reporting company, from that perspective we are checking and 20% mm. uh, is held by a trust. Correct. And uh, the trustee in this case, and I believe uh, you told that this trust is a discretionary, discretionary trust. trust. Yeah. So if we apply the rules of section 90, 100%. the provision says that in case of a discretionary trust, the trustee shall be considered as a SBO. Now hmm. in this case, trustee is not a natural person. person. Trustee is a body corporate. Correct question comes should we apply the mix of two rules hmm. 
which uh, which is one which is applicable for a company kind of a structure hmm. or second one which is applicable for a trust kind of a structure so this case prima facie falls in a trust structure which is a discretionary trust so we arrive to the situation that yes all right why limited holds uh, sbo relationship but sbo is not to be a corporate entity it has to be a natural person natural person naturally hmm. we have to apply the other test also and hmm. find out as to is there any person who holds majority in y limited hmm. so if we apply the same then mr b is found that he holds 75% in y limited so in okay. our understanding that mr b will be considered as significant beneficial owner of x limited as well hmm yes okay. this is this is i think this is all i think as per the example also this is what we intend to convey Correct. that uh, uh, we have to because ultimately we need to find the person uh, and mm. we will have to apply the mix but mm. an important question i i don't think ab nitesh ne bhi is pe touch kiya hai is generally uh, there is also confusion that lot of uh, trust mm. also do a 89 filing yes I think so that the question, this, this is the very important question that uh, whether the trust are bound to do an 89 filing first of all or not. In case they do the 89 filing, so then as per the explanation, the requirement of filing under 93 will be dispensed because it will be treated as a direct holding once the uh, intimation under 89 has been done. Hmm. but uh, this practice is not being followed uh, uniformly everywhere uh, in terms of while i have seen that there are a lot of uh, specifically in listed entities where mm. there are a lot of trust uh, which are acting as funds and mm. when they do acquire share they send uh, these disclosures to the company for filing but there is no standardization on this practice and since uh, the sbo rules cover trust uh, in form of a member and provide for this disclosure so the rules also uh, converse a situation or uh, uh, foresee uh, that uh, Or, or, or I can say uh, adds to the confusion whether that in case of a trust is there is a need of filing a uh, uh, 89 declaration or not. So Ankit, uh, I believe before we move forward, or maybe once uh, Nitesh completes, then we need to discuss on 89 as well because a lot mm. of will have the confusion with regard to the scope of 89 versus And the scope of 90. Ninety. Yes. Appropriate point of time. We need to deliberate on that and then take up this particular thread. From uh, so after Nitesh's presentation, uh, we will we will we'll we'll spend some time. Nine and ninety. Okay. 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 Hmm. Nitesh, carry on. Yeah. So. Uh... as uh, ankit singh is rightly pointed out that if you filed a declaration under section 89 and then you need not to file uh, under section 90 because the because the the principle of this 89 and 90 is to 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 identify the actual owner of a uh, shares so if i believe that if somebody is not uniformly informed throughout all the corporate uh, indian corporates if somebody is filing i think under section 89 then you need not to follow 90 because it is very much there in the records of the roc or uh, public at large that you are the owner of this company and you are, if you are declaring it then it is very much uh, either it be a 89 or 90 if it is very much declared then you need you you either follow one section either it is 89 or 90 but however the purpose of 89 is totally different from 90 so which will be discussed after this presentation so so the next uh, indirect route uh, could be a, a partnership firm or llp so an individual uh, so that an individual shall be deemed to be exercising rights or entitled uh, or entitled with respect to uh, the shares entitlement with attached to those shares uh, in the reporting company indirectly where the member of the reporting company where one of the member or shareholder of the reporting company is a llp Which which needs to be registered as per the SBO rules or LLP, which obviously uh, is registered, and then every partner becomes SBO, which is very strange. Uh, that even if you are holding a one percent stake in that LLP, you become a SBO. But PMLA rules uh, 
says that uh, that partner need to have at least 10 percent so they, they, this is a kind of variance uh, 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 in the provisions of Companies Act and the PMLA. So under uh, SBO rules, in uh, uh, Companies Act SBO rules, every partner becomes a SBO. And if, uh, if in the partnership firm, uh, body corporate is a member, then, then the individual who are holding majority stake in that uh, partner body corporate is become an SBO. Or such individual which holds majority stake in ultimate holding company of that body corporate becomes a SBO for that reporting entity. So there is also uh, another mechanism, uh, the last mechanism through which uh, members hold stake in a company that is called a pooled investment vehicle. So as uh, I've already, uh, as I've already explained that uh, there is a FATF uh FATF uh, agency which uh, of which uh, some country members i believe 40 are the members of this uh, agency if you are uh, if you are a shareholder of that entity of, of that uh, of that agency and you uh, and uh, then you uh, in, the, in the individual of that pooled investment vehicle then uh, if you are a, a general partner, then you are a SBO of that reporting entity and you are a investment manager becomes SBO and the CEO of that uh, where investment manager is a body corporate, then uh, you become a SBO. You need not to check whosoever investing in those uh, investment vehicle. Only the person who are managing that investment vehicle becomes a SBO under this SBO rules if you are a member of a FATF agency. Uh, if you are not a member of FATF agency, then uh, the rule which we have, uh, which are prescribed in the SBO rules, has to be applied on uh, on those uh, on the, uh, in case member in case of a member of that reporting entity. So, so there is uh, one more concept of a significant influence for uh, by which you all you can also become a SBO of that company. So uh, it need not be that you hold something or stake or having a some some stake in a company. If you have a, generally have a significant influence by virtue of any understanding or agreement, then you you will still be considered as SBO for the purpose of uh, Companies Act even if you do not hold any kind of stake because now because uh, if we go by the principle that who are the real owners who enjoys the right privileges who actually control a company are become a, uh, can still be considered as a sbo even if you do not hold anything in a company either directly or indirectly then if uh, the significant influence means uh, uh, power to participate either directly or indirectly in the financial and operating policy decisions of a reporting company, but not actually in control. Even if you have a power to participate, what can be the policies of the company, a financial policy or operating, how you operate. Uh, if you have uh, these kind of rights as per... Uh, I, either either it is expressly mentioned or any kind of agreement or understanding then then uh, it is very much that you are in the significant influence of a reporting company then you are a sbo for the purpose of this company's sbo rules let us take one example that uh, that why is a foreign investor need not be a foreign investor why is normal a, share, uh, a, a person a natural person who actually holds uh, 40 percent uh, in x limited and x limited has three subsidiaries okay and wherein uh, he uh, why being a uh, while uh, why holds a right to appoint one director in each subsidiary and his presence is necessary to for uh, to form the quorum so why exercises so uh, with this structure it is uh, very much uh, evident that why exercises significant influence because being a being forming a quorum 
and uh, holding a holding a seat on the on the seat uh, holding a seat of board in uh, each of the subsidiary it means you uh, you are you have a right to participate and uh, whatever is the policy decision taken by the board and without you it will not be a proper quorum of that uh, respective uh, subsidiaries then you will be deemed to be called as a significant influence of these uh, subsidiaries so uh, so so you need to file a sbo being considered why as a uh, are in the uh, are in significant influence so another concept is a control so control is uh, uh, is uh, defined under the companies act which means uh, which means right to appoint majority of the directors or to control the management or the policy decisions exercisable by a person or persons acting individually or in concert directly or indirectly including by virtue of shareholding or management rights or shareholders agreement or voting agreement or in any other manner so it need not be that uh, you uh, you exercise the control by virtue of any agreement you can simply have uh, an pro have uh, have an informal understanding that i will be controlling a company so uh, it will uh, it will need to be checked whether uh, whether any individual is uh, is uh, is in the control of a reporting entity or not so uh, taking the the last example uh, why limited being a for, uh, foreign investor holds uh, majority stake uh, uh, holds 40% in x limited and x limited uh, has uh, three subsidiaries xx xy and xz limited so why limited uh, has a right uh, which uh, in the subsidies which uh, which which includes right to appoint majority of the right to appoint uh, directors second right to appoint auditors and right to approve all kind of major decisions which can include uh, capital expenditure which can include uh, setting up of any uh, expansion of any business then in that in in this uh, in this example x limited uh, is exercising a control over these three three companies so so the so the why limited becomes a becomes a sbo so whosoever is uh, controlling the why limited become a sbo of these uh, uh, these subsidiaries uh, ankit sir anything you want to add Let us finish it. Uh, you carry on uh, because okay. uh, we have now received various questions. Okay, okay. So just uh, uh, quickly close it. Okay. So the concept of uh, holding beneficiary. Uh, so there is another concept of holding beneficiary interest along with uh, any other person. So I have I I have already highlighted in previous slides. If you are uh, acting in concert, then the entire shareholding of all the persons who are acting in concert will be clubbed together to check whether you are a SBO or not. So in this case, uh, C Limited being a reporting company, wherein B Limited holds uh, more than ten percent, and uh, A Limited being a ultimate holding company, wherein X, Y, Z Limited, they are acting in concert. Presume they are acting in concert if they are uh, if if they are uh, 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 jointly controlling A Limited, then they they all they all three becomes SBO for uh, C Limited. same in the case of the next example so mr a uh, mr a mr b and mr c shall be a holding company uh, uh, will become a sbo for x limited being a reporting company because uh, considering uh, uh, considering they are acting together so there is uh, another concept of through so in this case uh c limited being a reporting company <clears throat> wherein x y z are the shareholder of ultimate holding company ultimate holding company that is uh, b, uh, that is a limited wherein 
wherein there is a uh, one person who are actually not the shareholder but uh, but as per the direction of that person mr x y z uh, Uh, mr xyz act according to the directions of mr uh, dd so in that case mr dd will become a sbo however it is very uh, subjective issue you need to check uh, the evidence you need to prove that uh, mr uh, mr so and so person uh, are actually uh, are actually uh, uh, according to which according to whom uh, they are uh, all those uh, shareholders are uh, actually acting as per the directions of that other person you, uh, you need to prove you you have some uh, documents in your hand to prove that uh, that person is uh, is actually a sbo and uh, actually uh, exercising the rights in that reporting company so this is also one of the example where uh, uh, where uh, somebody is uh, giving has given loan to mr xyz being a shareholder of uh, ultimate holding company of b limited where uh, under a loan agreement and there is uh, there's uh, and there's no uh, there's no uh, there's nothing uh, understanding that uh, mr mr xyz will act in accordance with mr d so here we cannot say that mr d will become a sbo of that reporting company because there is nothing on record only a loan agreement which uh, in the general course of business uh, generally enter into for the purpose of the uh, general course of business which the company generally take uh, from any other person so there is a uh, there is another concept of holding beneficial interest through any other person so under uh, so there is some kind of example under what circumstances do we need to aggregate uh, the shares held by the immediate relative for ascertaining sbo and in such cases whether all the relatives are treated as sbo so so one thing is very clear that uh, the relatives per se are not actually diff uh, it is not uh, anywhere saying in the sbo rules that only the only the uh, only the shareholding of all the promoters will only be considered for the purpose of uh, uh, acting through any other person if uh, it will be a it, it will be presumed that they are acting together it will be presumed that somebody being a being a relation of husband or wife brother or sister acting on behalf of uh, some other relative then it will be presumed that you are acting in concert or you are acting through this uh, through your relative uh, it will be presumed that uh, it he, he he will be that all those relative will be a sbo for the purpose of this rule if you have something to the contrary to prove that we are not acting in concert or uh, that uh, that relative is uh, is only a relative there is nothing kind of uh, understanding or arrangement that that uh, we both act in concert if you have something to prove then uh, you cannot say that uh, all the relatives become sbo for the purpose of the for the purpose of the filing any declaration so th there is one more concept of direct and indirect holding because uh, for the purpose of sbo we need to check the indirect holding so uh, x uh, so in this case xy uh, xy limited xy limited uh, being a reporting company and uh, under x limited uh, x holds 25% uh, direct stake in the xy limited and miss mr a also holds directly in uh, fifth uh, also hold direct stake in the xy limited uh, so whether uh, uh, miss miss a is a sbo or not yes completely yes miss a is a sbo being uh, x limited is uh, uh, majority owned by uh, miss a but here we need to club all the holding whether it be a direct or indirect holding we cannot say it only holds 25% it holds completely 40% in xy limited being a reporting company so whenever miss a uh, file a declaration he has to club both direct and indirect holding so sbo rules uh, sbo rules uh, Uh, so who who has the obligation to file the sbo so obviously sbo himself or herself has to file sbo declaration so when it needs to be filed it needs to be filed within 30 days uh, 
uh, whenever you acquire any uh, SBO, when you acquire uh, that you will become a SBO or you become a SBO or whenever there is a changes in the declaration which you filed earlier with the company. So one thing is missing here that you also need to keep the register of a significant beneficial owner. So the time you receive a declaration, you need to make a make an entry in your register. So uh, here are the key consideration while you uh, uh, filing the declaration with the uh, file a declaration in uh, uh, file a declaration while uh, furnishing to the company. So uh, you need to select the if you have any kind of agreement with respect to control or significant influence. You need to uh, select. Uh, uh, select the point that uh, you have a control or significant influence. If you are a, if you become a SBO through shareholding, then you need to disclose direct and plus indirect shareholding in the reporting company, which uh, has to be more than 10% as per the minimum criteria. Where a declaration is made on account of shareholding, you also need to select dividend and voting rights. Whether uh, there is a uh, one more uh, contentious issue, whether uh, declaration needs to be filed uh, in case of uh, change in the direct holding or indirect holding. So we will answer in the FAQ uh, uh, when when we complete with the with the with the presentation. Then we will answer it uh, in the in the next in the time to come after this presentation is over in case a person ceases to be an SBO whether disclosure is required or not this is also one of the more contentious issue because there is no provision in the form whether if you Mr. X ceased to be a, a SBO in a reporting company then uh, how we need to file because form is uh, not actually prepared in a manner that uh, if somebody ceased to be a SBO then uh, then there is no provision in the form that you select that you uh, that mr a uh, ceased to be a sbo so that needs to be checked and uh, we will answer it uh, in the next uh, after this presentation uh, when the when our co panelists talk about in other uh, contentious issue about this sbo rules So the, uh, it is also uh, so as uh, as we talked it that key consideration in uh, while filing a declaration. So here, Mr. A. So you need to club while reporting while uh, filing a declaration in Ben One to the company. You need to club club fifty one plus ten uh, percent. That is sixty. That is sixty one. In this, uh, in this very case, uh, as we, uh, Mr. X and Mr. Y are husband and wife, and they are deemed to be a uh, deemed to be a SBO for the purpose of uh, SBO rules, uh, unless uh, they will prove contrary that they are not concerting with each other. Then, if if it is assumed that they are in concert, then they need to file uh, the declaration with the shareholding uh, of hundred percent each. Uh, by Mr. X as well as uh, Miss, uh, Mrs. Y. So you need to, uh, while filing a declaration, you need to club both shareholding of 100% uh, each. So uh, what is the obligation on the reporting company once it received a declaration? So once a company receive a declaration in band one from the SBO, then you need to file band two with the ROC within 30 days and also need to make entry in the in the register of uh, significant beneficial owner that is band three. Uh, the key consideration in uh, filing band two so details of only nine SBO can only be filed at a one point of time. The remaining details you can file a separate form. Uh, it uh, it should uh, you should not uh, you should not attach the details in the same form. You have to have uh, file another form for other SBOs if it is if there are more than nine SBOs. For submission, uh, for submission of details of the report uh, holding reporting company, some declaration shall be obtained from holding reporting company, uh, and but in that case, uh, Ben One is not required. 
in case of filing for the change in the earlier declaration so id identification of sbo is mandatory required to be filing details to the stock exchange so uh, since uh, under the uh, listing regulation uh, whenever you file a shareholding pattern to the company you also need to declare sbo of that shareholder so uh, kindly make sure that uh, there is a sync between the filing with the roc and the stock exchange So, uh, obligation on the reporting company when somebody is not uh, declaring himself or herself as a SBO and uh, the company has a reason to believe that uh, that person is a uh, is a SBO of our company. So, uh, so the company needs to take step now. The obligation uh, now on the reporting company to take some kind of action to uh, to send a notice in band two to uh, band four in fact to the to that uh, to that person that uh, uh, that uh, they think uh, and they believe that uh, that person the very person is a sbo uh, but one needs to consider that uh, that uh, individual that individual uh, through uh, that individual is become a sbo through uh, some kind of body corporate or through some kind of structure when can a company be said to be have knowledge of sbo so there are different uh, different criteria basis upon which you can analyze or you can come to a conclusion that uh, some uh, some person is a sbo in accordance uh, in, in, uh, is a sbo as per their understanding or as per as, as they have some documents in their hand to which has a reason which makes sure which has a reason to believe that 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 very natural person or uh, SBO for the purpose of this uh, SBO rules, uh, because uh, since you are a company, you are in uh, receipt of shareholding pattern, whether it be a public company or a private company or an unlisted company, then you need to check out who all are body corporates who are uh, shareholder of our company, and that share and that body corporate need to be uh, need to have more than ten percent of stake in your company where a company is a part to an agreement that empowers a non-member to exercise control or significant influence if you have that agreement in your hand or you have a even if you are not part of it but you have a you 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 come to know about uh, any such agreement then also you can uh, you 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 have very much uh, reason to believe that other non member is a uh, sbo where a company is making payment of dividend to any third part third party who is not a member on the instruction of a, of a registered shareholder then it becomes very much clear that uh, that person to whom the dividend is uh, actually uh, remitted is a sbo for the purpose of uh, determining SPO, where it is evident that a member is exercising voting powers based on the instruction of the third person. So these are the parameters where you can uh, you can analyze or you can determine that uh, the non-member or a person who is not a registered shareholder of a company is uh, very much be covered or uh, be covered or be declared as a SBO of our company. So, what are the consequences for default in uh, for default for non-filing of declaration by SBO? So, where a SBO, where a natural person who is a SBO fails to uh, give declaration or wrong information, even if they provide it, the reporting company has to have now the obligation in on the reporting company that they need to uh, apply to the tribunal that is NCLT that uh, and on the application made by the reporting company nclt uh, may suspend all the rights attached to the to the shares company and aggrieved person by nclt order may further apply to nclt in for relaxing or lifting the restrictions placed in shares within a period of one year from the date of declaration where no such application filed within the time then such shares shall be transferred to the authority uh, what are the consequences for default in filing of declaration by SBO? 
so how to deal with a situation where foreign shareholder is not willing to disclose uh, any reason including uh, gdr so the company as we already talked need to take steps uh, by applying to the tribunal to uh, to 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 actually make some kind of restriction on the shares or the holding held by such foreign shareholder so there are also exemptions provided under the rules where uh, you need not to uh, you need not to file a, uh, you need not to file a declaration so so first is the ipf authority if they have any kind of stake in the company that authority becomes a shareholder once you transfer it to the authority then sbi rule is not applicable to ipf then obviously the government is exempt and uh, holding reporting company is also exempt so if any reporting company is owned or controlled by the government that is also exempt and uh, uh, some investment vehicles uh, registered with sebi is also exempt some investment vehicles regulated by rbi is also exempt uh some investment vehicles regulated by iid is also exempt i think nitesh nitesh yeah. these are these are all things were there okay yeah. just uh, because now we have more questions so uh, uh, can you just wind yeah, up yeah 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 so there is one more concept of holding reporting company so it is also very contentious issue uh, when the reporting holding comp uh, when the reporting holding company uh, is a is a is a subsidiary of uh, any other company whether that uh, company needs to file a declaration or not so in this example uh, b limited being a reporting company uh, ho uh, wherein a limited holds more than 50% uh wherein uh, in the, in that uh, since a limited becomes a holding company wherein uh, in which and there is another company which also holds uh, more than 50% and in that uh, in that ultimate holding company that is y limited mr a is uh, holding uh, uh, or is owning 100% stake in the y limited so whether uh, in this case b, b being a reporting company needs to file or not so here b limited will file bantu with the roc declaring a limited as its holding reporting company because holding reporting company is exempt because uh, because b limited uh, b limited being a subsidiary a, st a step down subsidiary or the uh, subsidiary at the at the last uh, at the last layer is exempt from filing but it still needs to file a form uh, with declaring a limited as a holding reporting company so it is just a small yeah. point yeah if uh, a limited is a 100% holder of uh, b limited in that case uh, this kind of declaration regarding uh, uh, the holding company right may be correct but in other cases where uh, i am holding only 51% and maybe possible there are four shareholders holding correct. 10 and 10 percent correct, each. Correct, correct. In those cases, there may be a separate requirement for yes. filing mm -hmm. Just that I, I ha, yeah. Just I add to one that thing that point to keep in mind mm -hmm. uh, because rule eight says that to the extent shares are held by held the, by the company, reported holding, holding company. company. Right? So we have to be careful that uh, if it is a case of a wholly owned subsidiary. Mm -hmm. What uh, Nitesh has explained is correct. No further reporting will be required. But uh, if it is a case of a, just a holding company where mm -hmm. the other shares can be held uh, mm -hmm. by, maybe by some significant beneficial owner, then in that case, the other declarations mm -hmm. will also. Right, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, for the purpose of clarity, more clarity, the uh, Mr. Uh, Amit uh, was saying that uh, being a, a company, being a holding company of uh, B Limited, who is holding just 51%, there may be a cases 
there may be cases that uh, 49 percent is also owned by another company so for that company we need to file uh, for b company uh, you need to file two band two one is for the holding reporting company a limited and for the other shareholder who may be a corporate member of b limited holding 49 percent stake then that uh, reporting is also in addition to what we have done for the holding reporting company Sir, that is it from my okay, side. Okay, thank you, yeah. thank you, Ritesh. Thank you very much for giving a very extensive presentation, and uh, you have more or less clarify all the issues. Now, um, uh, when Nitesh has given the entire thing, so Ankit uh, and Amit, what I'll suggest you, uh, the point which Nitesh has not covered, just share the important point. Then I think we have a around 60, 60, 65 questions. So I will start questions and then you all three should give answer. So uh, uh, yeah, just up sir, briefly, we, uh, Amit Ji, please. So I was just thinking uh, one point that we have flagged in between with regard to section 89, mm. regarding section 90, right? Mm. I think uh, we will discuss on that and maybe a couple of uh, more uh, minor issues and then we can come straight to the question answer as Pavan sir has suggested. Yeah, yeah. You then I mean you start. So, so point uh, that uh, Nitesh was highlighting, we need to have a distinction between section eighty nine and ninety, which many times uh, professionals are uh, also confused and corporates are also confused because of the common usage of the term beneficial interest. The section 89 also uses the term beneficial interest and section 90 also uses the term beneficial interest. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, section 89, 10 itself defines the term beneficial interest and beneficial interest means the right to participate in the dividend, the right to participate in the voting or any other right that is available to the shareholder or a member of a company. That is the beneficial interest. Now, if somebody is uh, holding shares of a company, but he is not beneficiary, then section 89 comes into picture. I'll give you the example. Very common example is that ABC Limited wants to form a wholly owned subsidiary. They promote XYZ Private Limited. So all shares except one share is held by its nominee. And the because it is a private limited company, there are required to be minimum two shareholder. So one share is held in the name of Mr. A to meet the statutory requirement. So in that case also, the beneficial ownership is given to the company ABC Limited and MGT 456 forms as per the requirement of section 89 are submitted. But here everything is open and transparent where there is nothing behind the curtain. It is all in front of curtain where everybody knows that yes, Mr. A is a registered owner, but beneficiary is ABC Limited. Whereas the concept of beneficial significant beneficial ownership as Nitesh was explaining for the last 40-45 minutes was altogether different. If anything is visible in front is not significant beneficial ownership. Anything which is behind the curtain is the significant beneficial ownership. The other examples where uh, the concept of section 89 may be relevant like uh, if I am holding shares trust, or if I am holding shares in a partnership form, we know Companies Act puts a restriction that uh, a partnership firm cannot uh, be the shareholder, except in case of a Section 8 company. Similarly, Section 153 of the Companies Act 1956, from where this uh, concept of holding of shares in trust started, read with section 187c of 1956 act and now extended provision in form of section 89 of the companies act 
2013. If I am holding shares in a partnership firm, what usually happens? If X Y Z partnership is a shareholder, shares are appearing in the register of member as Mr. X partner of X Y Z partnership firm. Or in case of a partnership, in case of a trust, Mr. A trustee of ABC trust. If this is the case, I am of the view section 89 comes into picture where Mr. A declares that I am a registered owner. Shares are registered in my name, but actually the beneficiary is the trust. Similarly, Mr. X declares by filing form MGT 456, 6 is ultimately filed by the company, 4 and 5 are by the uh, person who is the registered third owner and the beneficial owner. So he will file that I am a registered owner, beneficial owner is someone else. Now the context that uh, Ankit ji was also trying to explain in the rules of section 90. The mention is that if you have already made, if the individual has already made a declaration under section 89, the provisions of section 90 does not apply. What does that mean? That simply means we need not confuse because that talks about a situation, the beneficial interest, significant beneficial interest provision triggers when a shares of a company are held by a partnership firm or shares are held by a trust. But we have learned just now that trust cannot be a shareholder and partnership firm cannot be a shareholder. So this situation generally by and large by default does not apply. But if, if a trust and share and a partnership firm are actually the shareholder, the significant beneficial provisions will be applicable. So ABC limited shareholder is uh, XYZ trust. So depending on whether it is a discretionary trust or it is a Otherwise, the trustee or the settler will become the significant beneficial owner. Similarly, if it is a partnership firm, the all trustees will become, all partners will become the significant beneficial owner. So that is the, I think, distinction uh, that we need to make between section 89 and 90. In very less situation, it will happen that section 89 declaration is already made and you are not required to make a declaration under section 90. So that is the uh, uh, point that uh, we were deliberating at uh, that juncture. I think uh, I, I think in the, in the only small thing is that uh, in law many cases where trustee is holding and then he files a declaration under 89 on uh, with respect to the trust. But now we have seen that you can also open a demand account in the name of the trust. So Perhaps. where the trust is actually holding the share. So in that case, in, in uh, there, then we will be needing to consider. Ankit, that is what I am saying. In those cases, 90 will be required. 90 will be required. And that's why 90 includes the uh, consideration that trust, trust can be shareholder and partnership firm also can be a shareholder. So that's why 90 is applicable because it is a legal uh, facade that is created to hide the identity of an individual. So if that is the case, then significant beneficial owner position comes into picture. If Mr. A is holding, then he is already like, I, I'll just repeat again. If let us say XYZ trust wants to hold the shares, maybe 10% of a ABC limited. So if XYZ trust is a shareholder, then trustee will become, if it is a discretionary trust, trustee will become significant beneficial owner. Now, other situation, let us say the shares are held in the name of Mr. A, Mr. X, who is a trustee. Then section 89 will come into picture. Do you agree, Ankit? In that case, you are required to follow 89 provisions and uh, MGT 456 will be required to be declared and you have the holder is Mr. X. 
and he has declared that i am holding the shares for the benefit of this xyz trust chapter ends the holder is not trust where the holder is a trust sbo provisions trigger that is section 90 will trigger only in those cases yeah i think so i think uh, uh, one fundamental difference is uh, 89 is 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 an apparent beneficial owner a person who apparently it is very clear that he, he or she holds the beneficial interest yeah, and in, in 90 we are we are trying to create a deeming fiction that that ultimate person whosoever fits the definition will hold the beneficial interest i think that is the and uh, uh, main definition sum and substance i think sir we can take the questions uh, uh, yeah. because uh, we are short of time otherwise yeah so now now the uh, the questions are more and it's continuously coming uh, uh, so what i'll do i have received questions in advance through email i'm taking these question first then i'll take up the question which we have received today okay so shivam can you just show uh, uh, so number uh, first question is understanding of sbo is it necessary to all companies to sbo not, not necessary okay to what extent should we trace this chain of identify the significant beneficial owner i think that the chain is the rule is very clear in terms of the chain so is, is in case there is the company which is acting as a shareholder then you need to find the ultimate uh, holding company of that company sure uh, if there is a trust uh, okay. our partnership then you need not to go into such detail unless okay. and until there are further companies as a partner then you need to apply the same formula so okay. there is no specific uh, uh, chain but yes you have to follow the rule okay. you have to continue application of the test until the test starts failing okay if there is no significant beneficial owner what should be our course of action regarding mc advisory nothing to be done i think mitesh mentioned uh, this point and in initially and uh, if you do, if you don't have any issue nothing it should be done so no, nothing has to be done uh, uh, the, the the companies has a confusion that Sir, because uh, that is an advisory that if you are supposed to you, if there is an sbo then you need to do the sbo filings if there is no sbo in case mca in future ask you why you have not done the sbo filings will submit the reply there is no sbo I, because there is no such there is no such case of informing mca that there is no sbo even that is also not the mandate but then how to make a difference between th those who have a sbo or those who have no sbo they companies have to evaluate that in case there is an sbo and if they have not done the filing they have to uh, ask the sbo to give the declaration and then they will do the filing and in case there is no for example if there is a company we all five are holding shares and acting independently sure. there is no sbo so nothing this should be done so i believe uh, as nitesh has indicated in the presentation also this awareness exercise is uh, a part of exercise by the ministry on the understanding that uh, fatf team is coming uh, in uh, this Next year month. itself for the purpose of evaluation so they also need to create a groundwork that uh, yes they had created sufficient awareness also among the corporates and it is not just that uh, they are having the penal provision and regulatory framework i think that is the that kind of exercise but if we have as ankit has suggested that uh, if we are in compliance then we can simply ignore without uh, any course of action but yes if uh, there is something which we have ignored or we have forgotten so this is a again attempt from the ministry that you should immediately woke up and do the necessary filings Uh, okay, so uh, now uh, it is required to see SBO in subsidiary company if in the holding company no SBO is identified. Yes, we have to see rule eight as uh, me and Nitesh was discussing uh, for the last slide. Uh, the rule eight is very clear and it says that uh, these rules shall not be made applicable. to the extent the shares of the reporting company is held by holding reporting company so the okay. example that he was giving uh, was 51% holding so what if the 49% is held by some other corporate and there is some other person who is holding majority so it is possible just because that uh, your uh, holding reporting company is uh, not having any sbo that does not mean your subsidiary will also not be having any sbo it is quite possible unless it is a case of a wholly owned subsidiary okay 
Shivam next. Okay. Now, uh, a, in ABC Private Limited, 95% of the shares are held by an irrevocable dis discretionary trust. The trustee of this discretionary trust is a company. Mr. A hold 80% of equity shares of the trustee company, whether A will be considered a significant SBO for ABC Limited or if the arrangement implies that there is no SBO for the shares held by the discretionary trust. Sir, this uh, Nitesh has already covered as an example. I think uh, A will be the SBO. We have discussed that. Okay. So the point for debate, I think, Ankit, uh, that remains uh, the industry is divided on this particular point, whether we are required to apply two tests in one determination, right? I think we clear? need to see the objective. Uh, Our view is very clear. I think objective is yes. that yes, ultimate objective has to be seen and in spirit uh, A will be SBO. So there is no uh, ambiguity that uh, we, we need not apply the two tests together. So one more thing to add. In fact, the PML rules are very clear. They says you need to uh, you need to dig out unless you reach to the actual person. So you have to have to check the natural person even if that uh, trust is a body corporate because uh, because there are many clarity which is given by under PMA rules. If you have any kind of uh, well, uh, there is a gray area, then you can also refer to the. I think uh, PMA rules are very much clear. They have a very better intent and they have explanation to each and everything to each and every structure where you can if you have a gray area in the company law, you can refer for the better clarity or apply apply your mind with respect to determining any SBO. But as a matter of suggestion, I think uh, that uh, what Pavan sir has been doing time and again, hmm. uh, raising the concerns uh, of the industry to the ministry for uh, better clarification. So this point can certainly go for clarification as a policy. Now, where, wherever these kind of issues are there, are we Ministry uh, can come out with the clarification that yes, in such situation, uh, the double rule or triple rule can continue to be applied, right? There are many other issues which can go together for clarification. Okay. So uh, next question, sir. So now this is big question. Nitesh, just uh, keep separate. Uh, we'll ask this question later on. Okay. So I, yeah. I will, I will, uh, I will cut it short. Uh, uh, Shivam, uh, back to the earlier slide. So here it is. Uh, so one uh, respondent is uh, uh, want to ask that uh, if uh, the ultimate holding company is unregistered CIC because there is a concept on the and uh, under RBA rules that you have a registered and unregistered CIC. Whether it will make a difference if it is unregistered CIC, whether you still be fall under the exemption route or not? No. If it is unregistered, you will not fall. Uh, have you have another uh, any contrary to it, uh, kids? Sir? No, no, I think, sir, if uh, if because the law allows that CIC to carry on the business as an unregistered CIC, so still it will be qualified as a uh, exempted entity because the law itself doesn't require you to get yourself registered. Uh, if I mean, yourself sir, idea, again, the spirit will come. Uh, idea is that the entities which are regulated by a separate regulator, right? Mm. Oh. RBI there where SEBI is there, there they have exempted. If you see the other exemption. No, so but there, is a, there is a reason behind it because you are not accessing any public fund and that is the whole objective of RBI not regulating that entity and their such size is also small. So uh, there is a rational behind RBI not regulating that unregistered CIC. It's not that RBI don't want to because they don't uh, have any impact in terms of the overall financial ecosystem considering their size and their own internal funds are being used. So for a specific if reason, you, RBI is you, exempted. Uh, if you you if you if read the exact language, uh, let me mm. pull it out, uh, because mm. the wording that they have used uh, for the purpose of uh, entitlement for the exemption, I think we will not fit into those criteria. Uh, maybe you... No, I have... I have sir, one here. point to just... Uh, we, we can ponder around that... If, uh, if we compare this clause to the other clauses, they have used the word registered. However, in this clause, they have used the word regulated. So there are CICs 
who are not required to be registered but need to uh, comply with the condition as uh, specified so, so, by the uh, RBI. Uh, so yes, there may be a kind of distinction you can make that I am still be unregistered, but I still be regulated by uh, by the RBI. That as uh, Ankit sir said, ki you uh, have to uh, you need you cannot until unless you are unregistered, you cannot have uh, public funds. So you still in any way are regulated, but need not be a registered. So Nitesh, that is where uh, my my point is there. Uh, if a unregistered CIC can be considered as uh, one regulated by RBI, in a manner it is being regulated yeah. by allowing you to not register. But sir, there because are the, other conditions. The regulation you covers follow. you and specifically allows you to not to not get yourself registered. Sir, maybe, maybe, sir maybe. I read regulated means that you comply with those conditions even being as an unregistered CIC. So, like as an unregistered CIC, you cannot access fund without registration. For example, if your asset size is 100 crores and you want to access fund, you cannot do the, uh, you cannot access until, until you register with RBI. So, in a sense, you are being regulated. Uh, yeah, I agree, I think... but when we see the intent behind, uh, I find uh, it may be a little tricky to take that kind of view. Maybe uh, you have a logic that uh, uh, I understand, but yes, maybe. We like, still say that uh, we should take a conservative uh, view, the point of uh, regulated versus unregulated. And uh, I think. Okay. I think uh, Nitesh, yes, uh, yeah, next Shiv. According to the definition of significant beneficial owner under regulation 2H of the rules, expression 3, uh, subsection IB uh, states that significant beneficial owner holds a majority stake in the ultimate holding company, whether incorporated or registered in India or abroad of the uh, of that member. However, the term ultimate holding company is not explicitly decide, um, uh, defined. Whether the 50% holding requirement be satisfied within two level above the reporting company or can it be extended further up to the corporate structure? Yeah, it may, um, yeah. Maybe more, it may be 10 layers, it may be 20 layers, as long as you are meeting the uh, test of uh, holding company, will continue to be uh, falling in the ultimate holding company definition. Okay. Does a partner with a 1% ownership stake in the partnership where the partnership itself hold more than 50% of reporting entity meet the criteria to consider as a SBO? Yes. Okay. In the scenario where A private limited is a holding company of B private limited with 65% holding in it and A private limited has a total of three shareholders holding 34%, 33%, 33% of equity shares respectively whether the requirement of file B, E and 2 uh, form is applicable? Prima facie, no, unless uh, these shareholders are acting together. Uh, okay. has to be tested uh, by uh, knowing more facts about the case, but uh, prima facie because uh, no one meets the criteria of uh, majority. Okay. Achha, now I have because uh, time is short. So if there is no additional point that whatever the speaker is giving answer, we will carry the next. Next, in the case of where a private limiter hold 19.75% of the share of B limited and A limited has the share holding four shareholders with ownership of percentage 38, 24, 18 and 20 respectively. Whether the requirement of file B, E and 2 reform is applicable? Depends if all these are acting jointly, then the requirement will trigger, otherwise not. Okay. If H Limited holds 100% shares on S Limited with the direct ownership of 40% of the indirect ownership through other subsidiary of 60%, it is important to note that a series of H Limited are held by Mr. A, 52%, Mrs. B, 48%, meaning there is no significant beneficial owner in the holding company H Limited. In this context, the status of SBO in S Limited would be determined by the direct ownership in H Limited. And since there is no SBO in H Limited, there may be no direct SBO in S Limited. Whether so the there, will be, there will be SBO in S Limited, considering Mr. A holds majority in H Limited. Okay. 
if your answer is different or if your answer is uh, additional, then you can. Okay, next. Please guide us the following matter. One of the four shareholder holds shares in one company as follows. Directly, directly 0.24%. Indirectly through shareholding in private limited, 12.14. Indirectly through shareholding in private limited, a uh, public limited company 2.14110 this total comes to 14.48 consequently the shareholders holds more than 10% of the company share directly or indirectly through corporate entities however it is important to note the shareholder passed away on 2nd october 18 and he had three legal heirs currently one of the legal heirs has filed a petition suit in civil court the resolution civil court is still pending so I think if it can be made out that since there is a dispute that then all the three are not acting together, we can make out a case that there is no SBO. Okay. What say uh, Nitesh Amitji? So what I will say, uh, meanwhile, uh, till the time uh, court finally decides the matter, all three should file uh, jointly and all three should be considered as a beneficial owner, significant beneficial owner, till the time uh, court decides the matter. Because uh, saying that uh, all three will not be acting together uh, without uh, any judgment by the court uh, at this point of time may not be in the interest. So, so if, there is continue... a, if there is a dispute, for example, because in that case, they all need to sign the form. No, no, no. Ankit, uh, having a partition suit does not mean that uh, it is a dispute. No, maybe I, we I are agreeing to a the part of legal process. No, no, no I am contemplating. Agree. I, I agree. There may be dispute. There may not be dispute. But I am presuming that if it is a plain vanilla partition uh, suit, then, so yes. that is just a legal requirement. Yes. So pending even of the partition suit, I can always uh, file the declaration by all three. Whatever will be decided tomorrow, we will accordingly amend. But as of now, we can't say that uh, there is no significant beneficial owner. That had the situation been the father was alive, then definitely father was going to be considered as a significant beneficial owner. Okay. Okay. So now, now I have, we have a questions which uh, people have asked today. When notice under section 90 issued to company were withdrawn by ROC? When notices under uh, section 90 issued to company were withdrawn by ROC? This is a question uh, uh, the, uh, we have mentioned. There were some notices which were issued uh, to and some of our clients also yeah. received it. And but there were some, I think, uh, informal communication or discussions with some officers in ROC where it was told the uh, notices have been withdrawn because no further action was taken on those notices. If Amitji has any further update on that, uh, this yeah, is yeah, what we know. Be... Absolutely, you are right. Uh, I believe uh, these notices were issued, uh, what we were told uh, while doing the informal discussions that uh, inadvertently MCA CMS system has uh, uh, issued certain notices at some point of time, whereas these were intended to be uh, not uh, to be shared at that point of time. It was uh, to be in form of advisory, which is now following. And uh, I believe uh, there is no consequence uh, to those notices. And ROC also has not proceeded to uh, adjudication proceeding in any of those matters. Uh, so far, uh, I have not came across. Okay. So we need not worry about uh, those old uh, MCS CMS notices. As okay. Far as, Next. But yes, we are in, in non compliance to comply. Yeah. In a company where shareholders are holding shares directly in their own name, but they are not related, put together. Their shoulding is more than 10%, whether they will be treated as SBO and need to be comply with the provisions. So if directly, then there is no question of uh, significant beneficial ownership, unless they have a 0 0.0001% uh, indirectly also. So you are mute. Okay, whether sending of BEN4 is mandatory or discretionary on the part of the reporting company. 
I think if you have a reason to believe and you have a uh, documents in your hand, then it will be obligation on the company that you need to send a uh, band four dec uh, band four notice to that uh, alleged uh, जो भी आपको लगता है that he is a beneficial owner. Then you need to it is obligation on the company then, not a discretionary. Okay, okay. Uh, what what is the relevance of acting alone or together? Further to be more uh, signify if X is a trustee in five trusts holding two percent each in the reporting company, and there are other additional two trustees in each of the five trusts who are different person, then uh, should X become the SBO? Sir, I said to answer, it is difficult. Or or the anybody who has asked this question, please uh, specify. Uh, se uh, discuss separately. We will give you answer. A limited because majority people have asked uh, one example and that you can't understand in one go. Okay, if reporting company do not receive any information after sending B and four, it is mandatory to go to tribunal for putting restriction on the respective shares. I think only where you have very uh, uh, solid evidence or reasons to believe that there is an SBU and then that they are not declaring the SBU. Okay, good. Okay. Company has only one SBO, one individual, and the company has filed the BN two form. However, there are there has been a repetitive change in the percentage of his holding in the parent company as parent company is a listed company. Do we need to file form BN two every time when there is a percentage change in the holding? We are not filing. Yeah, this is very contentious uh, mm -hmm. issue. I think we are all deliberate uh, deliberating on the same. And especially if uh, company is a listed one where the ESOPs are there, where the ESOPs are getting exercised every 15 days or mm. every month. So virtually you are required to file uh, that means bent to every fortnight. So I don't think that is the intent. Unfortunately, ministry has so far not uh, clarified as to what is the intention behind uh, uh, requirement for filing uh, bent to in case of a change. So what is the meaning of change unless ministry clarifies whether change means uh, entry as a SBO and exit as a SBO or it means uh, the particulars which are uh, registered for significant beneficial owner like their name, address and other details are changed. Whether that change will also tantamount to a change or it tantamounts to like change in a minor holding 0.01% holding is changed. Then also, so I personally feel what uh, Ankit has suggested that it should not tend amount to a change. And logic is that uh, idea of uh, having a significant beneficial owner identified is simply to have the name of person in the register that as soon as name is registered, you can go to the register of member, find out what is the significant beneficial owners uh, holding in the company. So there is no point uh, having a filing requirement at every point of time. So okay. logically it okay. should not be, okay. but I think this is a point which needs a clarity from the ministry. Okay. Uh, uh, please note down Shivam this point, uh, which we can ask from ministry. If a company has already filed BEN2 after received a BEN1 from X in a year 2020 and thereafter due to buyback is shareholding percentage of X changed marginally, say from 10.5 to 11 percent, then is X required to provide VN1 and is the company required to submit VN2 again for increase of 0.5 percent shareholding percentage? Sir, as discussed, both the actions are not required. Okay. If any holding company, there is no SBO, uh, will require to file its subsidiary, the SBO forms? I think we discussed that also. Depends ki what is the shareholding, uh, whether it is a fully owned subsidiary or it is 51% just. Okay. Uh, the company has filed BN2 in 2019 and after that share has been transferred to individual and there is no SBO after transfer, then the company need to be filed BN2 about this change. Now, this is again a tricky situation. There is no form as Ditesh in presentation also highlighted that unfortunately, ministry has uh, not considered the concept of secession of SBO. That should also be flagged to the ministry that they should bring out this concept. But they can do, but they can, uh, they can do the entry in the register. 
that uh, that uh, SBO is, is, is in the yeah, register. Yeah, yeah, that's all. Okay. Uh, if the SBO is filed by X company with ROC, how can we access that? This document is available for public inspection. There is, uh, I don't think there is any uh, restriction on uh, this document. Yeah, yeah very public. much. Yeah, very much in the public domain. Yeah, you can just pay the ROC fee and you can inspect the documents. Okay. If Mr. A is, if Mr. A is directly holding more than 10% shares in ABC Limited, like, like uh, say 35% in company and he is indirectly holding through a corporate more than 10% and in that corporate he is holding majority shares. Then does A, Mr. A need to be given B and 1 to compare ABC list limited? Yeah, he yes. needs to yes, needs to file and clubbing all direct and indirect holding. Okay. I mean, in a ABC limited, there is a person who holds majority of share holding, but the person belong to promoter category in such case should be considered all promoter for calculation, all belong to the same family. Generally, by default, we will consider all promoters acting together only unless there is a something which is contrary, which is evident that uh, yes, few peoples are not acting together, then only we will uh, not consider them. Okay. In a, in a unlisted company, 19% shareholding held by listed company, the promoter of the listed company holds only 30% shareholding in the listed company. In this case, whether any declaration to be given by the promoter of the listed company? I could not follow, sir. In a in a unlisted company, 19% of shareholding held by a listed company. Okay. The promoters of the okay. listed company hold only 30% shareholding in the listed company. In that this case, whether any declaration to be given by the promoter of the listed company. So we mean uh, no one is holding majority actually in uh, the reporting company. If yeah. that is the case, then uh, not required. Only 30% okay. is held by the promoters of a listed entity, which is holding uh, more than 10% in the unlisted entity, that is a reporting company, then answer is no, not required. Okay. If a father and son get uh, got separated and the father is holding more than 10% stake in a company, will it be considered as SBO and need to be declared? No, because they are not acting in concert. No, but uh, how can you, uh, by saying that uh, but you said no, I'm but... saying I'm separated, you must yes, have you are saying you are saying you are separated. You have a you no, but, have you but, have you have evidence. Yeah, but you have to show the evidence. Yeah, yeah, sure. Can indirect stake be held through natural person registered shareholder being an individual natural person? Can uh, uh, sir, sir, he, uh, can indirect stake be held through a natural person registered shareholder being an individual natural person? No, no, no. Uh, in that case, it will not be. It will be a case of a 89. 89. Okay. What is the majority stake? That is 50% or more? More, more than, than 50. 50. More than? 50. Well, 50 and point something something. So 50 plus one share is a, is a majority. Enough. Is enough. Okay. Uh, Whether in case of specific trust, trustee is not SVO? No. No. Or, or the beneficial owners. Who who are the who has the beneficial interest in that trust will be as view. Okay. Uh, whether wholly owned subsidy need to report as view in respect of its listed holding company, given that the listed company files share holding pattern on a weekly basis. Wholly owned subsidiary of a listed entity. Whether wholly owned subsidiary need to report SBO in respect to its listed holding company, given the listed company file share holding pattern on a weekly basis. It does not matter. Uh, means your SBO as long as what uh, subsidiary company has to do, subsidiary company has only to make a filing declaring that who is the uh, holding reporting company. That's it. Once we have declared, uh, I need not file any declaration. I need not file any change also. Okay. At any point. If uh, ultimate holding company, holding company not submitted BN1 to subsidiary, whether wholly owned subsidiary or subsidiary will need to file BN2 by indicating holding company. 
um, the situation has not been envisaged because the law envisaged that uh, holding reporting company will be uh, obligated to file. So mm. uh, means uh, my responsibility gets over as soon as I report the name of a holding reporting company. It will be a non-compliance on the part of the holding company that they have not filed bent to. So it uh, when when we say a holding reporting company, it means a rep holding company is also subjected to filing. In case ultimate holding company wherein there is no majority owners, where there is no obligation on the ultimate holding company to file the obligation, then what will be the scenario? But then, then the holding reporting is not reporting actually. Holding company is not reporting anything because of the there is no one majority owned that ultimate holding company. Then whether we needs to uh, whether that exemption will be applicable in case of subsidiaries yes, down the line. Yeah, I think rule eight is very clear. It mandates the company to uh, hold subsidiary company uh, is obligated to just file the name of a holding reporting company now whether the law is applicable on them whether they have actually found anybody or not we don't know whether the ultimate holding company will be having any sbo or not so it does not really matter my job is over as soon as i am able to find out as to who is my holding reporting company and then somebody will go to uh, check whether that company has filed any uh, document in this regard or not that is what okay. I did. Okay, Amit and uh, Nitesh and Ankit, there are so many questions. So I have to just be very uh, brief because time is over shooting. Given the Y Limited wholly owned, X Limited and W Limited wholly owned, Y Limited. And I think this question we will give separately answer because this is the complicated. X Limited has 10 shareholders. Each of them holds 10% of X Limited. X Limited holds 40% of Y Limited. Uh, whether all the shareholders are ex-limited are SBO for Y limited? If they are acting in concert, yes. If they are okay. not, uh -huh. then nobody is SBO. Mr. A holds 35% stake in X limited and X limited holding uh, company or Y limited. Mr. A is SBO for Y limited? No, because they are, he is not uh, owning majority stake. Okay. Mr. X is a shareholder of Y limited who holds more than 51% shares. Y limited and Mr. X holds more than 10% shares from Z limited, whether SBO. I didn't get it. Uh, if that uh, natural person who was ultimately holding majority stake, then he will be considered SBO for the other uh, reporting company. Uh, okay, one shareholder has 30% direct stake in reporting company and 30% stake through a private limited company, who is shareholder in reporting company, then is uh, he is the SBO? Yes. We need to club it. Okay. A body corporate, a body corporate hold more than 20% of the company name, uh, ABC Limited, the company ABC Limited required to file uh, BN2? No, body corporate is never required. Uh to file, but uh, who is uh, owning uh, majority in that uh, ABC? Okay. That needs to be checked. Yeah. Or okay. in body corporate, who owns the majority? In case of X hold 7% of ABC limited and XYZ limited holds 40% ABC limited, which X also hold 9% of XYZ limited, whether X became the SPO for ABC? No, no I'm lost in XYZ. No, okay, no, 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 no. no. Now I will ask only those questions which are uh, not the example because it's uh, until as you have uh, in uh, before your uh, and you can make it you can't give answer in light of these advisory being issued by ministry what will now be the date of the default for the determination of penalty? No date of default will remain same. Okay. Means if you are, if you are required to file uh, in 2020, let us say 31st December 2020 was given the deadline. Okay. If you have not filed uh, by that time, so default will start from then only, not from the date of advisory. Is it required to be reporting company to ask their institutional shareholder to disclose SB on periodical basis or only when the shareholding is changed? So periodical reporting is not required. That is not the intent of law. It is only when uh, changes take place 
and uh, again uh, the same question comes uh, whether change means change in shareholding but uh, okay. un until the clarity comes uh, we can uh, take a view on the same in case of charitable trust who is the sbo either managing trustee representative trustee or all trustee put together no all all trustees all trustee okay uh, uh, ankit ji uh, there is one natural person directly holding 10% and there is one uh, there there are other companies uh, holding uh, say 20% or more than that individual holds some percentage in those companies do we go further for sbo purpose need to check whether those corporate member are also owned uh, majority owned by that individual who is holding direct stake okay last two questions uh, a company has only one SBO, one individual and B and uh, two has been filed by the company. However, there has been a repetitive change in the percentage of the holding in the uh, parent company as parent company is the listed company. Do we need a file B and two form every time when there is a percentage change in the holding? So as uh, Ankit has mentioned, we have collectively taken a call that uh, for change in uh, shareholding, we are not filing uh, uh, bent to form. We are not considering it as a change for that purpose. Okay. Last question. In X company, A limited holds 60% stake but has absolute control. Other 40% is a strategic investor. Do we need to file SBA for the investor also? If that strategic investor has a significant influence, as we discussed that they have a right to participate in policy decisions or management decisions. So you mean to say if, if they, are, they are having a significant uh, control on the control policy? Control or high, yes. File. Significant Otherwise, influence, yeah. Because they are holding 40%, so you, you are saying not required. No, in if, if they are holding, if the strategic investor is having a significant influence or through... So 40, but he's holding 40% now. That no, the other significant person is influence, the significant influence can come even at a lesser percentage also. Yes. No? It can mm. be through the agreement 5%. also. With the 5% of investors, they can have the significant influence in the policy and decision making so, of the company. So you need okay. to see what is the document uh, of the strategic investor. If the document gives uh, any position of a significant influence, then yes, it will be required. Yes. Okay. So friends, uh, now uh, uh, I think uh, we have try to give answer and this presentation somebody has asked we will share this presentation to all of you and some question which you have asked on complicated structure a hold b or b hold c c hold d uh, because panelists uh, sometimes they they lost in this number game and in this complex situation so what we'll do if any question is not answered by us you can directly write to us uh, directly to shivam at indiacb.com we will give answer to you so friends, now it's time to wind up. Uh, just um, uh, what you say, Amit and uh, Nitesh, um, uh, for uh, 30 seconds. I think uh, we have moved uh, away a uh, lot from the position uh, from where, what was the mandate of uh, FATF. It's a laudable effort that India is also compliant of FATF regulations. And we have uh, done a significant journey uh, only only part is that ministry should take uh, little proactive steps uh, because the intention of the corporate so far what we have understood we are uh, directly doing the handholding of the corporate they are ready to comply with the law of the land the only difficulty is that in some of the gray areas where the clarity is not there i think government should come forward and give a clarity so that the non compliance does not happen inadvertently I think rest in all cases, we have not uh, seen any difficulty with regard to this particular provision. We have we have done a significant compliance, I believe. Nitesh? So, uh, my final uh, words on that SBO rules that uh, do not uh, fear about that advisory notices issued because these are not the show cause notice. It is just an advisory. If you have not uh, carried out the diligence of your uh, SBO, then it's better. It's uh, it's as soon as you done it, uh, just check that intent of the regulation, what it is suggested, why it is there in the statute. It is a decision of the policy to have the SBO because uh, now it has uh, the rules have been streamlined 
throughout all that regulation, whether it be a SEBI, RBI, or a Companies Act, uh, all these are regulation are on uh, are on are on same page. So if there is any kind of confusion, then you can check the regulation to have the clarity. But yes, if uh, MCA will clarify some gray areas, then it will be a uh, it will be a it will be a uh it will be a it will prove to be a a good a good a good move by the government or by the mca so 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 so, so don't take it as a show cause notice uh, i request that all the corporates to identify their sbo and do the filing as soon as possible because because i understand that there are many corporates who are receiving advisory notice on the basis of they have a data which have not filed it because because mca doesn't uh, has not actually analyzed or determined that uh, whether that company is not filing whether they have sb or not or not they just uh, filing on the basis of uh, non filing of form considering they they they, they determine it and if uh, they fall in it they do filing of the sb Nitesh, I am told uh, just a small correction. This is not yeah. on the basis of that MCA has done some uh, non-compliance check. But these notices, these advisories rather, have been issued to all, one and all, not only to company registered mail ID, but also to all of their directors. So that okay. is the cause of concern because uh, uh, directors are receiving these advisories. They are in turn sending it to the compliance officer and the managing director and they are reaching out ultimately to the uh, professionals. And that is what the objective was. Mm -hmm. The ministry was intending to create awareness among the last mm -hmm. mile. Mm -hmm. That was the objective. No, I was saying that uh, who's... I was saying Nitesh, that... Nitesh, the Nitesh, was, Nitesh, ah, yeah, Nitesh, yeah. I, I, th I think... Ah, okay, I, okay, okay, okay. I think time is uh, already overshooting. So, friends, uh, 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 Vishal Garga has asked about the video. So, we have a YouTube video also. You can go to Corporate Professional channel as well as you can go to our website uh, www.corporateprofessional.com and on video on the webinar, you can find this the video download. You can download also. So, friends, it's a time to close this session. Thank you very much. We have received more than 60 questions today and yesterday and we have tried and the presentation we will share with all of you. And these are the some, uh, uh, we have done the poll. Are you familiar with the concept of significant owner? Uh, I think uh, my 86% uh, people, 84% people have uh, told yes. And 16% people have said no. Have you implemented it or taken a step to ensure the SPA compliance in your organization? 75% say yes and 25% no. 25% people should must consider because this is a violation. Are you aware of the penalties or consequences? Uh, 59 say yes and 41 say no. It's a contradictory view because then uh, uh, it's a very serious point. Do you think SBO regulations are effective in preventing uh, illegal financial activities? 76% say yes and 24% say no. So this is single choice question which we have asked during this. So uh, the majority views they are aware, but those who are not aware, they must learn. And this is very important. And the very simple point is you have to reach the natural person behind the entire curtain. So you have to cross the curtain and reach to the who is uh, behind the show and who is that natural person. That is the basic concept. Person acting in concert and person individually, these are the things you have to check. So with these things, we are closing this uh, uh, session. And as you are aware, this is our 151st webinar. Last uh, week, we celebrated 150 webinar. Now, this journey, which we have started long back, three years back, will continue. So next Friday, that is 3rd of uh, um, uh, November, we are having a first uh, webinar on uh, updation. So whatever updation has taken place from the first uh, uh, Friday of the last month to the third Friday, third, uh, uh, um, um, November, that is the first Friday. Whatever updation has taken place, we will discuss uh, on that day. So on companies law, security law, firm, firma, as well as IBC, we will discuss. We will give you presentation that what are the changes, what are the issues, how to implement, and then we will uh, 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 take up the question answer. So till then, thank you very much. See you on third. 
uh, for this webinar, 4 p.m. 